Acorns were eaten by at least half the Indian tribes in the United States. They were a staple food only in California, feeding three-fourths of the native population. The coastal tribes of California preferred acorns from the tan oak because of their rich and oily quality. Trees were not the property of any individual, but belonged to the village. Harvesting was done mostly by women, with the help of children. When the acorns became loose in their cups, they were ripe for harvesting. To climb the trees, a sapling ladder was used. A boy climbed toward the top of the tree and shook the acorns loose as he worked his way down. With a harvesting pole, the branches were struck, often very hard, to knock the acorns off. Only the good acorns were gathered. Those with wormholes or cracks were left. Younger women gathered acorns for widows and those who were too old. The acorns were poured into a burden basket and carried to the place where they were to be stored for winter. Storage was handled in a number of ways by different tribes, mainly in caches. Among the southwestern Pomo, there were two types of acorn cache, both family owned. One was constructed atop a large redwood stump, the other inside a hollow tree. In the first type, an enclosure of dry branches was built upon the flat top of a redwood stump. Bracken fern and redwood boughs were worked into this framework. Dry tan oak leaves were placed on the bottom to protect the acorns from dampness. The acorns were poured in and spread over the leaves. Dry sticks were placed over the top as a framework for the roof of branches, ferns, and leaves. Redwood boughs were worked into and over the framework. Fern fronds were added to fill any opening that remained. A layer of tan oak leaves was added to further protect the acorns from the weather. A final covering of boughs completed the cache for the coming winter. This type was usually replaced every two years. The second type of cache was prepared inside a hollow tree or stump. These were often located by men while hunting. The women were told of these discoveries. 
The most desirable caches were located near the villages or harvesting areas. The brush was first cleared away. The hollow was next prepared to receive the acorns. A digging stick was used to clear away debris and level the ground in the hollow. The floor was covered with dried tan oak leaves to protect the acorns from the dampness. A nest was prepared in the leaves and the acorns poured in. The acorns were covered with leaves for further protection. A barrier of logs and earth turned away groundwater and helped to prevent raids by small animals. Long, heavy slabs of redwood bark closed the front and covered the top to finish the cache. This type of cache was more permanent and kept the acorns drier. As needed, quantities of acorns were removed from the cache. Bitter acorns are among the many plant products which are indigestible or poisonous in their raw state and must be processed before they can be eaten. The acorns were first cracked with a small hammer stone on a heavy slab. The outer shells were husked off. Young children sometimes assisted in this. The thin coats of the kernels were loosened by rubbing them vigorously together. By blowing and tossing the kernels into the air, the light skins were carried away. The kernels or meats were then ready to be ground into meal. A mortar basket set on an anvil stone held the kernels. They were ground with a pestle. A ring of Spanish moss around the mortar basket prevented any meal from leaking between the anvil and the basket. The grinder placed the calves of her legs on the rim of the basket to hold it down and to bring herself closer to her work. In former times, certain formalities were observed by the grinder and others as she performed her task. They believed that grinding should be done under some type of brush shelter. Failure to do this would bring rain. The booming noise made by the pestle was associated with thunder, the first sign of rain. The grinder frequently shifted the pestle to the other hand as one became tired. She never drank water while she was pounding. So the meal would be evenly ground, it was frequently stirred. 
Occasionally, the grinder dug her fingers into the small pit of the anvil stone to remove the impacted meal and make room for the larger fragments to roll down. At intervals, the grinder traded her pestle for one of a different weight. This prevented her from becoming too weary. The southwestern Pomo believed that children standing behind the grinder would cause her to become tired more quickly. Also, no love songs could be sung while grinding, lest the pestle break. When the meal became fine enough, it was ready for sifting. The sifting basket was held firmly by means of a loop of string. Tapping the basket brought the light fine meal over the edge. The coarse particles were left behind and were transferred to another basket to be reground later. Only small amounts of meal could be sifted at a time. Every particle of meal was saved. The finely sifted meal was ready for leaching. Alder branches were gathered. These would be spread around the leaching basin to keep the area clean. Certain spots were selected for leaching acorns. They were always kept free of debris. The leaching basin itself was usually prepared near a river or spring where an abundance of water was available. This basin was on a gravel and sand bar. A shallow bowl was dug in the sand. A layer of wet, coarse sand was first added to the surface of the basin. Wet sand was more easily used than dry to complete the form of the basin. The sand was smoothed and firmed over the surface of the basin, forming a layer half to three quarters of an inch in thickness. Finally, a layer of fine dry sand was added. It was patted smooth. As the meal was leached, the water dissolved out the bitter tannic acid and filtered through both fine and coarse sand into the gravel below. 
as part of a water breaker, several redwood twigs were tied together with a small whip. A twined basket was used for carrying water. The basin was sprinkled to settle and hold the sand in place. The water also removed any dirt by washing it through the sand. The surface was again smoothed and firmed. A final sprinkling prepared it for the acorn meal. Stones were placed around the rim and outer sides to prevent the water from washing away the sand. Larger rocks reinforced the lower sides. Branches of alder spread around the basin prevented sand and dirt from blowing into the area. The pit was then ready for leaching. To prepare for the stone boiling, a fire was begun. The meal was carefully poured into the basin and was spread evenly over the sand. A special basket of twined open work was combined with the redwood twigs to make a water breaker. The basket and twigs gentle the fall of the water to prevent mixing of meal and sand. The water breaker was moved about as the water was poured through to first dampen the entire surface of the meal. Then the breaker was put down in various places as the pouring continued. Only cold water was used to leach the meal. A tiny scoop of thimbleberry leaf removed foreign particles. The leaching process was a lengthy one. Many basketfuls of water were needed before the meal was completely leached. With clean hands, the meal was tested at several points to determine whether all the tannic acid had been leached away. If the bitter tannin remained, leaching continued. When another test proved the bitterness gone, the basin was allowed to drain until the surface showed numerous cracks. To remove the meal, the top layer was scraped up with the tips of the fingers and placed in a basket. The layer next to the sand was handled differently. Without any scraping, the fingertips were pressed firmly into the meal. Bringing the fingers slightly together as the hand was raised, 
loosened a portion of the sticky meal. The fine sand had to be washed away. Turning this surface up, water was poured or splashed onto it to remove the sand completely. A basket caught the wash water with its load of sand and meal. The heavy sand settled to the bottom. Above it, a layer of meal formed. The water rose to the top. Careful decanting separated these three. With the water poured off, the layer of thin meal was then poured into another basket and saved. The remaining layer of sand was thrown out. The meal was inspected for sand or other particles. It is remarkable what a small loss of meal resulted from this ancient leaching process. Preparations were next made for cooking the meal into a mush. Fine-grained rocks suitable for stone boiling were collected and washed. The fire had now burned to coals. These were made into an even bed. The rocks were then placed in the bed of coals to heat. A screen of small branches protected the face from the heat of the fire. Covering the rocks with hot coals helped to heat them quickly. Thimbleberry leaves were used to wipe the hands. The cooking baskets were rinsed with a thin gruel to increase their water tightness, and preparations were made to cook the meal. The meal was needed to bring out the oil. The cooking basket was partly filled with water and the meal was stirred into it with a looped stick. By putting the hand into the basket, the consistency of the mixture was tested. If the meal ran quickly off the back of the hand, more meal was added to the mixture. A pair of looped sticks, one of which had a mesh woven across the loop, was used to handle the rocks. The ashes were wiped off with thimbleberry leaves. Each rock was then washed and placed in the cooking basket. Stirring kept the rocks moving to prevent scorching the bottom and sides of the basket. As the mush cooked, it thickened rapidly. When the rocks cooled, hot ones were added. The mush boiled vigorously and in a short time was cooked.
Utensils were washed before removing the rocks from the cooking basket. As each rock was removed, the mush was scraped off with hand and tongs. Then the stone was placed in a basket of water. They were still too hot to be removed by hand. When the rocks cooled, the remaining mush was washed off. The utensils and the basket were washed. The mush was now ready to eat. In the traditional manner, a mussel shell was used as a spoon. The Indians of California made greater use of acorns than any other people, bringing their methods for gathering, storing, and processing to a high measure of perfection.